His pure and beloved messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. The Almighty God states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُوقِنُونَ صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. On this holy and blessed night, I extend to you, my respected brothers and sisters in faith, my sincerest congratulations on the birth of the master of the youth of paradise, Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. Al-Imam Al-Hasan, peace be upon him, was born in the third year after the Hijrah, the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him, from the city of Mecca to Medina. If you study the life of Imam Al-Hasan, peace be upon him, you would find that he was truly a shining star in the dark history after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Imam is one of those leaders in the early period of Islam who has been oppressed by history. Till this very day, history has indeed oppressed Al-Imam Al-Hasan salam because history has not presented the true image of the Imam, peace be upon him. The Imam, peace be upon him, is also oppressed by his own followers who claim to love his grandfather and father, but they have not done enough to learn more about, more about his life to defend the position of their Imam in their society and to seek his teachings and implement his teachings in society. When the Imam Ali salam was born into that beautiful house of Imam Ali and Fatima al Zahra, he truly brought, brought joy to that amazing house. That beautiful house, the house which was built on the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib carried his eldest son as he was overcome with joy. He presented him to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet told him, Oh Ali, what did you name him? Imam Ali told him, Ya Rasulullah, do you think I would name him before you would name him? I have left the naming of my child up to you. You decide. The Prophet told him, Oh Ali, do you think I would name him before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names him? Let me wait for revelation and see what Allah names him. At that point, Jibra'il the angel descends down to the earth. He gives his congratulations and his salams to the Prophet. And he says, Oh Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salam to you. He congratulates you on your grandson. And he says, Give him the name of the son of Harun. Because you, Ya Rasulullah, you're like Musa, the Prophet, and Ali ibn Abi Talib is like Harun, the successor of the Prophet. And Harun had a son by the name of Shubbar. So you gave the name of Shubbar to your grandson. The Prophet told him, O Jibra'il, what is Shubbar in Arabic? Tell it me in Arabic. Because in that society, the Prophet was living in an Arabian society. Jibra'il told him, Shubbar in Arabic is Hassan. Therefore, give him the name of Hassan. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he gave him the beautiful name of Hassan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you think a man who is named by the Almighty God is not a rightly, divine, divinely appointed leader for humanity? Unfortunately, till this very day, you see, Millions of Muslims around the world who are ignorant of the true history that occurred after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, accuse the Imam salam of committing mistakes in his life, of not leading the Muslim Ummah the proper way. A man who's named by God, do you think he can go astray? 
the Prophet, peace be upon him, raised Al-Imam Al-Hasan. For seven or eight years, Al-Imam Al-Hasan had the honor of seeing his grandfather, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in Medina. He had the honor of being carried by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. One hadith narrates that once the Prophet was sitting on his pulpit, on his mimbar. He was giving a speech to his companions in the mosque. When suddenly Al-Imam Al-Hasan, he was maybe one or two years old at that point. He walks into the mosque, but because the Imam was wearing a long garment, he kept on tripping over. He'd walk, he'd trip, and then he'd stand up, and then he'd trip again. He came in the middle of the masjid. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, saw Al-Imam Al-Hasan in the middle of the masjid, the Prophet immediately ended his speech. He went down from the mimbar. He carried Imam Al-Hasan. He kissed Imam Al-Hasan. He came back on the mimbar while holding the Imam in his lap. And then he looked at the Muslims. He smiled and he says, Allah is very truthful in the Quran when he says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." Indeed, your wealth and your children are a true test, are a true tribulation for you in this life. The Prophet, peace be upon him, on a number of occasions, he demonstrated how much he loved Al-Imam Al-Hasan, peace be upon him. The Prophet could not bear hearing Al-Imam Al-Hasan cry. Whenever he would pass by the house of Fatima, alayhi salam, and he would hear the Imam, peace be upon him, as an infant crying, the Prophet would be pained. He would come to see if there's any problem, if he can help Fatima in any way to stop the Imam السلام, from crying. Abu Huraira, in one hadith, he narrates, he says, whenever I see Al-Hasan, this is way after the Prophet, peace be upon him, Abu Huraira narrates, he says, when I, whenever I see Imam Al-Hasan, I can't help it. I can't control my emotions and my eyes begin to flow with tears. I start crying. They told him, why Abu Huraira? Why do you cry when you see Al-Hasan? He said, because I swear, I saw the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, kissing Al-Hasan, and then the Prophet would say, Allahumma inni uhibbuh, fa'ahibba man yuhibbuh. Oh Allah, you know how much I love Hasan, so oh Allah, you love whomever loves Al-Hasan. Abu Huraira says, when I would remember this incident, whenever I would see Al-Hasan, I couldn't help but cry. Because I knew how much the Holy Prophet Imam al Hassan used to distract the Prophet on his member, and the microphone distracts me on my member. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One very beautiful hadith gives us an amazing image of how Al Imam al Hassan and Hussein used to play with one another. By the way, some people, when they think of the Imams, they think the Imams were human beings. I've known some people, if you say Imam Al-Hassan and Hussein were playing, they'd, you know, somehow be surprised. No, Imam Hassan can't play with anyone. Imam Al-Hussein cannot play. It's not right for them to play. Sometimes we forget that yes, while Allah has chosen them and purified them, but they are still human beings created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have the same emotions as you and I have. The difference is they obey Allah and they used their emotions in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they were still normal human beings. This hadith tells us one day Imam al-Hasan and Hussein were playing, kind of like wrestling with each other. They were little children. And Fatima was watching. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was watching. The narration states, when the Prophet saw them in the middle of their match playing with each other, the Prophet began to encourage Imam Al-Hasan. He started cheering him and encouraging him. 
So Fatima to Zara, she looked at the Prophet, she said, Ya Rasulullah, how come you're not cheering Hussein? You're only cheering Hassan, that's not fair. The Prophet says, Oh Fatima, don't you see Jibra'il, the angel of God? He's on the other side cheering Hussein, so I have to come to cheer Al Hassan as well. So we make it a fair match today. Those moments in which the Imams would play, they would bring so much joy to the heart of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Those were the best moments in the Prophet's life where he would see these two children, the flowers of his heart as he would call them, playing with each other. But the Prophet had also another purpose. The Prophet wasn't just, you know, this emotional grandfather who really loved his grandsons, no. By doing this, by giving them so much importance and playing with them in front of the companions, the Prophet peace be upon him was sending a message to the Muslim community because the Prophet was aware that decades down the line, these very two grandsons, one of them will be martyred in Karbala, one of them will be poisoned. The Prophet knew that his Ummah will betray them. So he was sending, sending a powerful message to the Muslim community that these two grandsons are appointed by God. Never betray them. Sometimes the people, no matter how much you speak to them, you know, some people, it's just not enough for them. So the Prophet had to physically demonstrate to them how much he loved them, so that these images would never leave their mind. Al-Imam Al-Hasan salam truly lived a life with so much difficulties, with so much trials, with so much tests. Al-Imam Al-Hasan salam became officially the Imam of the Muslim community when his father Amir Al-Mu'mineen, peace be upon him, passed away. At the age of 37, Al-Imam Al-Hasan became the Imam. And he remained an Imam for about 10 years. As he died while he was about 47, 48 years of age. But during those 10 years, my respected brothers and sisters, the Imam alayhi salam led a very difficult, a very difficult life. He experienced a very turbulent segment in the history of Muslims. Until this very day, many people have not understood the role of Imam al Hassan in saving the religion of Islam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, once told his grandson al Hassan, he told him, Oh Hassan, you resemble me. You look exactly like me in two ways. Physically, oh Hassan, you resemble me. And your akhlaq, your manner, your character also resembles me. And indeed, the people who are around him could attest to the fact that he reminded them of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, through his actions, through his words, and through his physical features. When we want to speak about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, where do you start? Do you start with his worship? Do you know that Imam al Hassan walked from Medina to Mecca barefoot on his feet 20 or 22 times for the Hajj? And he would say, I'm visiting the house of God. I'm ashamed not to walk to the house of my Lord. When it came for the time of Salah, the Imam would stand, prepare himself for wudu. And those around him, they say, we witness how he would shake. He would quiver and shiver as he was performing his wudu and as he was going to pray to establish his salah. He would be asked, oh Hassan, what is it that makes you tremble? He says, do you not know whom I'm standing in front of? I'm standing in front of the king of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes me to tremble in fear. The worship of the Imam alayhi salam was amazing during his time and he was known by everyone to offer the best of worships. But the Imam alayhi salam was known for a very important quality. And the Imam alayhi salam is the symbol of this quality. And that is generosity. When you look at the lives of the Imams, peace be upon them, truly Al-Imam Al-Hasan stands out 
as being the Imam who was amazingly generous. The Imam السلام, was generous in two ways. The first way, through material generosity, the Imam, peace be upon him, would help anyone who was in need. History tells us that Imam al Hassan, two times in his life, gave all of his wealth away for poor people in the way of God. All of his wealth, everything that he owned, he gave it to the people. And three times in his life, he divided his wealth in half, he kept half for himself, and he gave the other half to the people. This is generosity. If I own $1,000 and I give $50, yes, that's great and Allah will reward me. But that's not the full meaning of generosity. Generosity is what Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him, used to do. Two times he gave everything that he owned. And three times he split his wealth in half and he gave half of it away. Now that's generosity. One day a man came to Imam al Hassan, السلام, the Imam, on that specific day, he really didn't have anything to offer to the man. The Imam asked for help. The, the man asked for help from the Imam. The Imam told him, oh man, I apologize. Today, God is my witness, I have nothing to give you. But I'll teach you something. Go and do something, you'll get some money. He told him, what can I do? He told him, go to the Khalifa, because today the daughter of the Khalifa has died. Go to the Khalifa and give him your condolences by telling him this phrase. The Khalifa has not heard a powerful word of condolence yet. So you don't go and give it to him. The Imam teaches him the phrase. He goes to the Khalifa. As he's offering his condolences because the daughter of the Khalifa passed away. He tells him, O oh Khalifa, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protected your daughter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this daughter whom you have lost now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected her by having you sit on her grave. And he did not break her dignity by having her sit on your grave. You weeping for her is better than her sitting on your grave and yelling and weeping in front of people. The Khalifa, when he heard these words, he was truly moved. He says, yes, I swear by God you've said the truth. Because you said the statement to me, now I have no sadness. I realized Allah protected my daughter. But then the Khalifa told him, I doubt these are your words. Where did you get these words from? Who taught you the statement? He told him, Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him. He's the one who taught me the statement. The Khalifa was so overjoyed, he told him, Yes, yes, Imam al Hassan is truly a noble man who would make such statements. The Khalifa gave him his great reward and he left. The Imam السلام, tried in every single way possible to help the people in his society. One day a person told him, Oh Hassan, why, do you, why are you so concerned about the people? Whoever comes, you make sure you do not return them. You do not deny them. Why is it so? The Imam السلام, told that person, he told him, Oh man, I'm afraid if I deny a single person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deny me his mercy. So I make it my full concern to give to those around me in society. This is one part of the generosity of Imam al Hassan. But there is a greater part of generosity attached to the personality of Imam al Hassan. And this is what we need to understand, my respected brothers and sisters. Generosity, giving your wealth, is truly a great honor. But there is something higher than that. And something more honorable than that. And this is what Imam al-Hasan alayhi did. The Imam, peace be upon him, was under extreme pressure from his enemies, from Muawiyah and his people, and from his own companions after the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam. The Imam, peace be upon him, wanted to fight Muawiyah, this evil man who was playing with the religion of God and using the religion as a power base for himself. But the Imam had no soldiers. 
The Imam, peace be upon him, had no one who truly defended him. When the Imam tried to rally his supporters, they told him, Oh Hassan, we're tired of warring. During your father's time, we engaged in three big battles. Enough is enough. We don't want to battle anymore. The Imam told them, but don't you see this man? He's playing with the religion of God. He's changing the religion of God in the name of God. They told him, oh Hassan, we apologize. We know what you say is true. We know you're on the right path. We know you're the Imam. And we know he's a dictator, an evil ruler who is misusing religion. But enough is enough. We just want to live a normal life. We don't want to see and participate in any battles. The Imam السلام, therefore realized that his companions will not support him. In fact, he knew there were traitors amongst his companions. One of the generals of the army of Imam al Hassan was willing to, to surrender the Imam because Muawiyah tried to bribe him. He told him, I'll give you a large sum of money. He said, I'm willing, whatever you say, Muawiyah. Muawiyah, through his wealth and through his power, he was able to bribe so many people. The Imam couldn't trust anyone. Even some of the people around him, once they stabbed him in his thigh because they were upset with him. And these people, they were upset because the Imam wasn't going to war. The Imam was between two groups of people. And they were both applying pressure on him. Some of them said, enough is enough, we don't want to go to war. The others will tell him, we'll kill you if you don't go to war. The Imam السلام, had to develop a plan over here to expose the evil actions of Muawiyah. When you are fighting, when you are in a state of battle, Many people cannot see the truth. They get confused. They don't know the truth on which side is it. So Imam al Hassan السلام, had to develop another way to expose Muawiyah and his evil schemes. So the Imam, peace be upon him, agreed to the peace treaty. Initially, the Imam did not want to make peace with Muawiyah, but the Imam was forced. He had no other option. So the Imam goes to Kufa from Medina, Muawiyah comes from Syria to Kufa and over there they decide to come up with a peace treaty. Muawiyah signs the peace treaty, Imam al Hassan signs the peace treaty. Immediately after the peace treaty and this is where Imam al Hassan السلام, exposed the evil intentions of Muawiyah. You know Muawiyah in front of people he was a good man. He appeared to be a righteous person. He appeared to be a man who would pray. He'd speak about justice. He'd speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People did not see the true colors of Muawiyah. In private, yes, he showed his true colors. But in front of these people, he had brainwashed them. So Imam al Hassan السلام, had to develop a plan to expose Muawiyah. So the Imam signed the peace treaty knowing that Muawiyah will not keep the promise, Muawiyah will break the peace treaty. And as soon as Muawiyah signed the peace treaty in Kufa, Muawiyah got up on the minbar. And do you know what he said to the people? He said, oh people of Kufa, all history books from all Muslims narrate this incident. Muawiyah stood on the pulpit and he said, oh people of Kufa, don't think that I have ruled you and wage these battles and wars so you can pray, so you can give zakat and charity and so that you can go to hajj. Because you already do that. You people pray, you give zakat, you go to hajj. That's not why I'm ruling you. That's not why I fought you and waged all these battles against you. Oh people of Kufa, the reason why I waged battle against you was because I wanted to rule you to govern you, to rule your necks, as he says in Arabic. That's the reason why I fought you. I want kingdom, I want power over you. And then while he was on the minbar, he made his grand announcement and he said, the peace treaty that I just signed with Imam al Hassan is under my feet. This is exactly his words. The people were shocked. This is Muawiyah, the Khalifa saying this? He just signed a peace treaty with Imam al Hassan. After signing it, he says, The treaty is under my feet. 
I have no respect for the treaty. At that point, Muawiyah exposed his true intentions. People were brainwashed. Muawiyah, by bribing many of these companions of the Prophet who would fabricate false ahadith, these people, the naive people of the time, truly were brainwashed. They thought that Muawiyah was the true Khalifa and that the number one enemy to the Prophet was Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, Muawiyah made it Allah in his empire that on Fridays, when people go to Friday prayer, the speaker on the member, it was an obligation upon him to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. For 70 years, Bani Umayyah cursed Ali ibn Abi Talib on the member. Imam al Hassan, one of the points that were in the treaty was that he would stop cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. He just signed the treaty, he went on the member, he told the people he's fighting them for dunya, and then he told them the peace treaty is under his feet, and then he began attacking Imam Ali. People were brainwashed. People really did not know. Is Ali ibn Abi Talib a good man? Or not a good man, because they'd see some of these companions who were bribed by Muawiyah, paid Muawiyah to fabricate a hadith, and they'd come up with all these hadith against Imam Ali alayhi salam. Let's look at history and see what happened after the Prophet. The narrations we have today, the teachings we have today, who did we take them from? Is it from these fabricators and forgers? Or is it through reliable sources? Sahih al-Bukhari, which is considered the most authentic book to so many millions, millions of Muslims around the world. You know, very interestingly, the Imam Ali, Imam Ali, he spent 30 years in the Prophet's life. Do you know how many hadiths Sahih al-Bukhari narrates from Imam Ali? 70, about 70 a hadith is the number of hadiths that Bukhari narrates from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, this man who was with the Prophet for 30 years and who memorized every single word of the Prophet. But you see to the contrary, Abu Huraira, a man who came and lived two months with the Holy Prophet, at maximum some hadith say, which are inaccurate, two years. Okay, let's say two years, fine. There are over 2,000 hadiths in Bukhari from Abu Huraira. A man who spent two years with the Prophet, but Ali ibn Abi Talib, the son-in-law of the Prophet, the successor of the Prophet, the man who never left the Prophet, the one who was with him in every battle, in every move, in every event, only 70 hadiths. Doesn't that tell you there's something wrong? Mathematically, isn't there something wrong in our history? Muawiyah would pay these forgers to fabricate a hadith against the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon them. So Muawiyah gave his speech in the masjid in Kufa, and he came down, expressing his true emotions and his true colors. And at that point, Imam al Hassan salam achieved his goal. Because his goal was to expose Muawiyah's evil intentions by signing the peace treaty. And Muawiyah did indeed expose himself. However, the Imam, peace be upon him, had to pay a very heavy price. And this is why the Imam is truly a generous Imam. And this is the real generosity that the Imam offered to the Muslim Ummah. The Imam was willing to sacrifice his reputation and his dignity for the sake of establishing and saving the religion of Islam. You know, because the Imam signed the peace treaty, his very closest companions started cursing him and started abandoning him. One of his companions, his very close companions, he walked into the room of Imam al Hassan, and he told him, Oh Hassan, you humiliated every believer by signing the peace treaty. Imagine the Imam taking such harmful and hurtful words. Imagine how the heart of the Imam was being injured. The Imam told him, I did so to protect you people, to protect the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Had I not signed that treaty, Muawiyah would have obliterated all of you. I signed the peace treaty to save the religion of God. Didn't my grandfather, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, do a peace treaty with the Jews in Medina, with the pagans in Mecca? 
And by the way, when the Prophet did the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah with the pagans of Mecca, sure, there were some companions, some companions who complained to the Prophet. One of them, the second Khalifa, he was angered with the Prophet. He told him, oh Muhammad, don't! Don't do this with the pagans. Don't sign a peace treaty with them. So it wasn't the first time that these people were complaining and objecting to Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon him. This whole tradition of objection and complaining started during the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Imam Al-Hassan beautifully explained to them that he did so to save them from being obliterated. And indeed the Imam saved them by doing so. Muawiyah was a different man than Yazid. Yazid publicly would drink alcohol. Yazid was a man known for adultery, known for vicious crimes. Imam al Hussein salam had no choice but to fight Yazid and not accept any peace treaty with him. But Muawiyah was a different man. Muawiyah was a man who was cunning, sly, he was, you know, very sharp and he knew how to brainwash the people. The people had not seen the other side of Muawiyah. Imam al Hassan had only one way to expose Muawiyah and show the people his other side by signing the peace treaty and by demonstrating to the Muslim Ummah that Muawiyah knows no Lord, knows no promise, knows no treaty at all. Because as soon as he signed it, he went publicly and he broke the peace treaty. And that had a, an Im and a huge impact on the Muslim Ummah to realize who is truly the Khalifa. The Imam Ali Salam was generous because he had to sacrifice his reputation and his face for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was truly injured by he and his closest companions who were not understanding his role. One day the Imam Ali Salam was in Medina when a man from Syria came. And this also demonstrates how generous the Imam was. And how through his amazing akhlaq he saved the Muslim Ummah. A man from Syria came when he saw Imam al Hassan. He told him, Oh Hassan, may Allah curse your father Ali and may Allah curse you. Imam al Hassan looked at him with so much gentleness. Imagine a man's cursing you on your father, what would you do? Especially when you're on the right path and the other person is brainwashed. Imam al Hassan looked at this man with so much kindness and compassion and he told him, Oh man, oh old man, I think you're a stranger in this city. Is there anything that I can do for you? If you're hungry, I'll give you food. If you need clothes, I'll clothe you. If you need money, I'll support you. Why don't you come to us? Come to my house, oh man, and I will give you whatever you want. This man was shocked. This is Hassan and this is how he speaks. Muawiyah had brainwashed him. He thought Hassan was this evil tyrant dictator, this kafir, you know, this infidel. When he heard these words from Imam al-Hassan, he was shocked. He began to cry. He says, I swear by God, you are truly the Khalifa of Allah and Allah knows where to place his message. Then he told Imam al-Hassan, he says, oh Hassan, when I came from Syria to Medina, there was no person whom I despised more than you and your father. And now after hearing these kind words, there is no person whom I love more than you and your father. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali. The Imam Ali salam, although he signed the peace treaty, the Imam never stopped preaching the Muslims and demonstrating to them what an evil man Muawiyah was. The Imam still expressed that amazing courage, especially when once he went to Damascus, you know, modern day Damascus to Syria, which was the capital of Muawiyah. Muawiyah, when he saw Imam al Hassan in his own city, in his capital, and all the people were surrounding the Imam. And the Imam السلام, was embraced by the people. Just simply looking at him, saying one word, people started loving him, uh, Imam al Hassan. Muawiyah felt threatened. So he came up with a plan. You know, he gathered his cronies around him and he invited Imam al Hassan. He forced Imam al Hassan to attend the gathering. 
Once the Imam began sinning, they started viciously attack him once by one. All sorts of evil accusations. Muawiyah started himself, then his companions began to attack Al Imam Al Hassan. But yet, Imam Al Hassan, even though he was facing the ruler, the Imam Al Hassan السلام, never wavered. He continued showing that courage, and he was never afraid to speak the word of truth. When they all finished, he responded to them one by one, but then he looked at Muawiyah, he told him, Oh Muawiyah, look who's talking here. Who's your father, O oh, Muawiyah? And who's my father? Who's your grandfather? Who's my grandfather? Who's your mother, Muawiyah? And do you know who my mother is? Then he told him, O oh, Muawiyah, let me tell you. Let me keep on giving you more information in case you don't know. Do you know that at the Battle of Badr, my father Ali ibn Abi Talib was the one who was carrying the banner of the Prophet and the banner from Islam. And the one who was carrying the banner of infidelity, the one who was carrying the banner of shirk and kufr, was you Muawiyah and your father Abu Sufyan. Remember in Badr, you and your father were the leader of the pagans fighting the Prophet. Did you forget in the Battle of Ahzab, in the Battle of Uhud, my father Ali ibn Abi Talib carried the banner of the Muslims and you and your grandfather carried the banner of the pagans. Did you forget that Muawiyah? Did you forget in the battle of Ahzab when your father was riding a horse and you and your brother were guiding the horse, the Prophet looked at you and he said, may Allah curse the rider and the two ones who are guiding the horse. Did you forget that? Did you forget when the Prophet peace be upon him cursed you and he prayed against you. He said, Oh Allah, never allow Muawiyah to satiate his hunger, to be full. You know, Muawiyah was a very, very heavy man. Because no matter how much he would eat, he would never become full. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, had did this dua against him. He told him, Muawiyah, what are you saying? Look at yourself. Look at the history of your fathers and grandfathers and how much they tortured the Prophet, peace be upon him. And you talk about my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. There was silence in that gathering. Imam al Hassan got up and left and he destroyed the evil, you know, reputation of Muawiyah, the reputation that he had built for himself. The Imam destroyed it. So the Imam, even though he signed the peace treaty, but after Muawiyah broke the peace treaty, the Imam never remained silent. There are some people, unfortunately, some historians and some Western academic scholars till this day. They, when they referred to Imam al Hassan, they referred to him as a man who lacked courage. And God forbid, some of them call him a coward. Imam al Hassan, he remained patient for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Imam, peace be upon him, his body after he was martyred, he was taken to his grave. Marwan ibn al Hakam, this evil man, who hurt the Prophet and who was one of the greatest enemies and staunch enemies of Imam al Hassan? He came carrying the body of Imam al Hassan. Imam al Hussein looked at him, he told him, Marwan, you did all those evil things to my brother Hassan, and now you have come to carry his body? Marwan, you know what he said to Imam al Hussein? He told him, Oh Hussein, the patience and perseverance and forbearance of your brother Hassan was greater than any mountain that I have seen. Even his most avowed enemies attested to the fact that Imam al Hassan السلام, in his akhlaq and his patience there was no human being like him at the time. But he did so for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he did have to pay a heavy price. Muawiyah finally achieved his evil goal when he conspired with the wife of Imam al Hassan, Jorda, where she gave him poisonous food. And this was the way that Muawiyah figured he would save himself and save his rule. Because if Imam al Hassan continued to live, he would have destroyed the empire of Muawiyah. Muawiyah did not want that. He wanted to rule. And he did achieve his evil goal of killing al Imam al Hassan. Junada, one of the companions of Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him, in a beautiful hadith, he says, Shortly before Imam al Hassan passed away, I went into his room and I saw a bucket next to him. 
and I saw pieces of the liver of Imam Al Hassan in the bucket because the poison was so heavy that the Imam, peace be upon him, he was spilling blood into the bucket. I saw the Imam in that miserable state and the face of the Imam had turned yellow. In that moment, Junada says, I told Hassan, oh Hassan, can you give me some words of advice? Imagine the Imam is in pain. He's living his final moments, yet the Imam did not say no to him. He says, yes, I'll give you some advice and I'll briefly go through the words of advice that Imam al Hassan gives to Janada. He tells him, oh Janada, istaadda li safarik. Be prepared for your final journey, the journey of Akhirah. وَحَصِّلْ زَادَكَ قَبْلَ حُلُولِ أَجَلِكَ And make sure that you don't go empty-handed into the next life. Gather as much as you can good deeds in this life. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ تَطْلُبُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْمَوْتُ يَطْلُبُكَ And oh Junada, know that you're running after dunya, after the world. At the same time, death is running after you, O oh Janada. Don't forget that. Then he tells him, O oh Janada, وَعْمَلْ لِدُنْيَاكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَعِيشُ أَبَدًا Work in this life, O oh Janada, as if you will live forever. Protect your reputation. Establish a decent living. Establish a proper family. But then he says, وَعْمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَمُوتُ غَدًا But at the same time, live in this life as if you were to die tomorrow. See this beautiful balance the Imam gives him? Live in this life as if you would live forever. But at the same time, be prepared. Such that if you had to leave tomorrow from this life, you're well prepared. And this is the beauty of Islam. Islam doesn't tell you abandon this life and abandon this world. No. Islam says live properly. If you had to live 1,000 years, live all those years properly. But at the same time, you also need to be prepared for the hereafter. You know, the love of this world is like a ship that is sailing in the midst of the oceans. Without water, a ship cannot sail. You need water in order for this ship to move. The more water, the better it is for the ship. If it's very shallow, it could be a very bumpy ride in the ocean or on the coast. The more water, the better it is for the ship. But I ask you, the minute the water goes inside the ship, what happens? That's it. It's over. The world is good for the believers because this world is the place in which we build the hereafter. But the minute that the love of this world touches your heart and penetrates your heart, you're gone. You sink just like the ship. Then the Imam السلام, he tells him this final word and listen to the beauty of the words of the Imam. He says, وَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ عِزًّا بِلَا عَشِيرًا O Janada, if you want honor and dignity without having a tribe to support you. You know in the Arab society, those people who came from powerful tribes, from big tribes, they had power, they had honor, they had dignity. Imam al Hassan tells Junada, Junada, if you want power and dignity, but without having a big tribe, وَهَيْبَةً بِلَا سُلْطَانٍ And if you want majesty, without having power, without being a king, فَخْرُجْ مِنْ ذُلِّ مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ عِزِّ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ Then Junada, take this formula. Take this golden formula. Then exit from the humiliation. Exit from the disgrace of the disobedience of Allah and enter the grace of the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The disobedience of God is a disgrace. And the obedience of Allah is the highest honor and dignity you can achieve. Junada, you want that honor and dignity and that majesty? Without having any government to support you? Without having any tribe to hold your back? Then leave the disobedience of God and go to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will give you that honor and dignity. On this night, my respected brothers and sisters, we remember the sacrifices of our master, Imam al Hassan. Let us remember our Imam throughout the year. It is unfortunate that we have abandoned him. Only one night throughout the year, and that's it. Let's become closer to this man. 
This man is the master of the youth of paradise. He will be my master and your master in Jannah. Don't you want to know your master? Let's get to know our Imam better. Let us embrace his beautiful teachings and implement his teachings. Let us take his generosity and sprinkle our societies with his generosity. The generosity, the material generosity and the generosity of his akhlaq. That way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide us and hold us fixed on the right path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all to the straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins, to accept our deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all those who are ill and need our dua. We ask Allah to give them a speedy recovery. And let's please recite this holy verse five times together so that Allah answers your prayers and the prayers of those who are in desperate need of being cured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please raise your hands, raise your hands and recite everyone together with me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّنْ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ نسألك اللهم باسمك الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد My respected brothers and sisters, it has been a great honor to have been amongst you the past two weeks. I really enjoyed my stay with this wonderful community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring me back to this community in the near future, inshallah. Please forgive me for any shortcomings, and I ask your prayers, and inshallah, once I go back to the holy city of Qum, I will keep each and every one of you in my prayers, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allah